Welcome back, folks. Today we're going to look at factor markets, and all this information is in your book, Chapter 20, on the pages listed there. We're going to look at what the factors of production are. We'll talk about how factor prices determine the efficient allocation of resources, and we'll determine um, how factor demand for labor, land, and capital are determined, and we'll figure out how to calculate the profit-maximizing um, level of inputs that go into uh, production. So we start with the idea of uh, different types of markets. We've looked at product markets, those are for finished goods and services, and that's pretty much everything we've looked at so far in microeconomics. There are other markets known as factor markets, which are the markets uh, for the inputs that go into producing those goods and services. And uh, those markets are what we're going to be talking about. So when you look at the circular flow diagram, we talk about how there are households and there are businesses, and they are competing in, and uh, participating in both the factor and goods market. So households purchase goods from the goods market, um, and then businesses, in order to make those goods, need to purchase different factors of production from the factor, factor market, like land, labor, and capital, which is what we're going to talk about. So we're going to look at the, the factor markets for um, the four different factors of production, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship, with capital being broken down into both physical capital, which is the tools and machinery that go into making things, and the human capital, which is the skills and training of the individuals who are um, employed by companies. Land, labor, and capital are all things that can be purchased within a factor market, and so therefore they have a price um, that they are purchased at, and these things are called factor prices. And for land and capital, it's the rental rate, and we'll talk more about that in a couple of days. And for labor, it's the wage rate. The factor price is important because it will help kind of determine what the demand is uh, for each of these factors of production. So the demand is actually what we call a derived demand. And um, so let's think about it in terms of um, hot new jobs in the industry. We might say that the hot new job in, um, in the working world is nursing. Well, why is it um, the hot new job? Why is there a, a large demand for nurses in, um, in the marketplace? That's because the demand for nurses is derived or comes from the demand for the good or service. So there's more need for nurses because there are people living longer, getting older, um, and they need medical care. And because there's now a greater need for the service, there then becomes a greater need for the, um, for the people who are going to provide that good or service. And once we know that um, what the factor price is, then we can begin to determine what the actual demand curve looks like uh, for nurses. Or we can take a different example. Let's pretend that there's um, a study that comes out that says that drinking coffee increases the likelihood that someone will get cancer. So we could look at the market for coffee bean pickers and say that the supply of coffee bean pickers and the demand for coffee bean pickers has an equilibrium point but with this uh, new study it, it turns out that because people want um, will want to drink less coffee because it's cancerous there's then a greater uh, or less of a need I should say for coffee pickers and that would then impact the uh, the demand curve for um, for hiring workers to to pick coffee beans and so that's what we mean by a derived demand. Now the next question then is, um, what does our demand curve look like? How do we derive that, um, that demand curve? Well, one of the things we look at is the, um, the total product, the amount of output that can be created by a given set of workers. Um, and so we could look at a table like this and say, with zero workers, I have zero product. If I have one worker, he can produce eight units of whatever the good is. If I hire two workers, they can produce 18 units of goods between them. Three workers can produce 26 uh, units between them, and so on. And knowing that, then I can look and I can, I can identify the uh, marginal product of labor. I can look at how much additional product can be produced by an, a one more unit of uh, labor. And so I can say then that the first worker has a marginal product of 8, the second worker has a marginal product of 10. They increase total product uh, by 10 units with an increase of one laborer. The third worker has a marginal product of 8, the 
fourth has a marginal product of six, and so on. I can then take this information and calculate what's known as the value of the marginal product of labor. I can basically see how much the additional work you create, the additional output you create, is worth to me. And um, so I can maybe assume that every unit of output is um, sold at $2 a piece. And if that's the case, then um, I would say that the value of the marginal product of labor for the first worker is $2 per unit times the eight units they produce. So the value is $16. That first person essentially brings $16 of revenue into the company. The second worker produces a marginal product of 10. So at $2 per unit, they bring in $20 of revenue to the company. The third worker is $16. The fourth worker brings in 12 the fifth, $8, and the sixth brings in four. Again, because they're producing two additional units, and those two units are being sold at $2 in this example, so it's a $4 value of the marginal product of labor. So then the decision on how many units of labor to hire is relatively simple. Um, I look at uh, the wage rate, and I say, where is the last time where the marginal benefit which is the value of the marginal product of labor, is equal to or greater than the marginal cost, which is the wage rate per worker. And in this case, if the wage rate is $8, then I look down and I say that at a, um, a level of five workers, that fifth worker added $8 of revenue. He cost me $8, so um, the marginal benefit is equal to the marginal cost. So in this example, the optimal amount of labor that should be hired would be five workers. I wouldn't go to six because that sixth worker only brings in four dollars of revenue but cost me eight so he would, would represent a loss and so the optimal output here would be marginal revenue equals marginal cost and I would hire five workers. So in general we're going to hire workers as long as the value of the marginal product is, um, is greater than the wage rate. I will stop when they are equal and I will not go any further if the wage rate is greater than the value of the marginal product. And that's true for labor. It would be true for land or capital as well. It's just that the, val the um, value of the marginal product of capital, for example, would have to be greater than its rental rate. And we'll get into that in a couple of days. We could look at another example. We could say that George and Martha have a vineyard and that employees are given a wage rate of $200 a piece. And if I was given this uh, production schedule, I could calculate the marginal product of labor for each of the workers. I could say the first worker's marginal product is 19, the second would be 17, the third's marginal product would be 15, 13, and so on. And if we're selling um, the goods, at $20 a piece, then the value of the marginal product of labor for the first worker is $380. For the second worker, it would be 17, which is their marginal product, times 20, so it would be 340. The third worker, his value of the marginal product of his labor is 300, that's 15 units times the $20 per unit, and we could just keep going down. Now, if the wage rate for workers is $200, then again, I would look at this and say that the optimal number of laborers would be five, that I ought to buy, uh, pay for five laborers because that fifth person brings in $220 worth of revenue but only costs me 200 so I basically have a $20 profit. But if I go to that sixth worker, they're going to bring in 180 but cost me 200 I'm going to lose $20 if I hire the sixth worker, so I'm going to stick to just five. We also know that because this is a demand curve, it's like any other demand curve we've looked at. So if there's a change in price, if the wage rate changes, then we're going to have a movement along the demand curve. Because remember, a change in price is a movement along the demand curve caused by a shift in supply of some sort. So if the wage rate rises to 300, then instead of hiring five workers, um, I'll hire two. Because it's, the demand curve is at $300 is... Um, little less than three. So I'll hire two workers at $300 in wages. If the wage rate drops to $100, then I'll be happy to hire uh, seven workers. Now there are some things that will cause a shift in the demand curve 
uh, for these different factors. And the three primary shifters are going to be a change in the price of goods, a change in the supply of other factors, and changes in technology. We can look first at changes in the price of goods a little more deeply. Um, if we present, pretend for a moment that, um, that the price of wheat increases, then we would expect to see the value of the marginal product of labor you know, shift to the right, uh, meaning that at a market wage rate of $200, I'm willing to hire more workers now than I was before. Whereas if there's a decrease in the price of wheat, I would see it shift to the left, and at a $200 wage rate, I'll be hiring fewer workers than I could before. Sort of makes sense because you're not bringing in as much money um, per unit, so you're less interested in producing um, as many units as you did before. And we could look at it too um, from a table perspective and say that if the price of um, the good went from two dollars to four, then our decision um, would change as far as how much labor we would hire at an eight dollar wage rate because when the price is two dollars I'll hire five workers but when the price jumps to four dollars I'm willing now to hire six. And we can look at changes in the supply of other factors and its impact on demand as well. I mean, basically if you increase the uh, the amount of land that someone's working on or the number of machines that are available for uh, workers to use we would expect to see an increase in productivity or an increase in marginal product um, and because of an increase in, in their productivity, we would generally see a shift to the right in terms of demand um, for this other factor. So if you're, um, if you're an orange picker and now there are, um, there's more land on which uh, orange trees have been planted, then there would generally then be a greater um, need for orange pickers. You, you would demand more people to, to pick oranges on this increased orchard that you have. And so we would see a shift to the right in terms of the demand for labor. And if we reduce the number of other factors um, available, then that would generally decrease your productivity per worker, and that would shift your demand then to the left. So if um, you, you sold off a lot of land from your orchard, you wouldn't need as many workers anymore, um, it, regardless of what the price level was, regardless of the wage rate. And we would see then a left shift in the demand curve for labor. The last thing is changes in technology, and generally speaking, technology improves, productivity increases. And if productivity increases, um, then the value of the marginal product of labor uh, increases at every given wage rate, at every given um, level of output. So we would see a right shift in, um, in the demand for labor. So generally speaking, what we see is that improvements in technology um, will actually uh, add to the demand for some some jobs in general um, and will ultimately end up with an increase um, in overall employment. We'll take uh, some more practice on uh, working through this value of the marginal product of labor and identifying the appropriate um, amount of labor to purchase uh, when we're in class and I'll see you then.